Thank you, Ben. Appreciate you guys. Great job today. Come on, give the Lord a good hand. Guys, are you having, having, are you having a good time this beautiful Sunday morning? Yeah. Happy Sunday and happy Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know who you guys are rooting for. There's a whole lot of red out there. I didn't know we had so many gangbangers in the house. <laughs> Well, I want to welcome our guests. Would you give your hands, put your hands together for all of our guests in the house. Maybe you came with a friend or found us on our social media. We want to make, make sure that you feel at home. If you didn't get one of those great Connect cards, it's a great way to get connected to information about TFH and how to get involved. And you have questions, to an you'd like some answers that we can help you with, um, we'll reach out to you. Just raise your hand in case you didn't get one of those and someone will put a card in your hand. Anybody at all? I know she'll put that card in your hand. And uh, I want to welcome you guys back to week two of our campaign and our series, Imagine. Is anyone here imagining greater things for your future, for our future as TFH and Thomas? Come on, is anybody believing for? Is anybody imagining greater things for us here at TFH and Thomas? Tell your neighbor God's got big things in store for us. At, at the... Uh, at the end of service, let me drop this on you real quick. We're having Discover, and I'd love to, love to meet you over there in the lobby. There's a curtain, black curtained air, off area, and love to meet you over there. If you're interested in getting connected to the house, how can I serve? How can I get involved? Um, how can I get connected to community? How can I, what's the next step for me? Discover is the place for you, and uh, we're going to be in the lobby right after service, so come join us over there. Now, we're also going to do something special at the end of this service, and we're, how many got one of these? Wave it at me if you got one. All right. If you didn't get one, raise your hand, and they'll get one of those to you. We got lots of cards. All the cards. Connect cards, prayer cards, commitment cards, credit cards. No, we're not giving out credit cards. But we'll gladly take yours in Jesus' name. <laughs> well, we're gonna what we're going to do at the end of this service is we're going to write down names of people that we are believing that God is going to save. He's going to rescue He's going to bring into the house. Part of our Imagine campaign is believing for these people. So you can fill it out now. You can fill it out at, at, toward the end during our last worship song in the service. But as you write down names on this card, on the back of it, it says, Imagine Changing Lives Forever. On the back, there's a scripture there, or not a scripture, but it says, God is big, so we dream big. That's not quite a scripture. But <laughs> you can fill out, you know, three, four names of people that you are saying, God, I am believing and I'm praying that you would save this person, that one day they're going to walk into the house. When we get into our new building, are you excited about our new home? When we get there, they're going to be right there sitting next to me, and they're going to experience your love, your power, and your grace. But I want you to put at least one person who's you might consider a long shot. You're asking, what's a long shot? A long shot is a person that you say it would take a move of God an absolute miracle for this person to ever come to Jesus, come to church. But I believe God can do it. How many believe God can save our long shots? So write one of those people. It might be, might be, might be your neighbor, might be your boss, might be your wife. Whoever it is, you can write their name down and fill that out. So we'll pray over those names, and we're going to, put them in, we're going to fold them up and put them in these containers toward the end of service. Sound good, church? And I want to I ask you, as we continue this series, we got two more weeks in February, three more messages and services total part of this campaign. Would you make it a point to be here? Make the house a priority. If this is your home church, make it a priority. I, first of all, give it up for the person next to you who came out on Super Bowl Sunday. They said, I got time to get to the game. We got time. We're not going to miss anything. By the way, if the Niners win, it is because you showed up today. Just so you know. <laughs> um, and we're going to throw up some key dates that we do want to remind you about um, that are upcoming. So take a picture of these as they put it on the screen. It's part of our campaign. Um, for those of you who are new to the house, maybe you're a guest, you can, we'd love for you to keep joining us during this series as well. We're going to put that up, guys. All right. TFH and Thomas. That slide looks just like the one before it. <laughs> All right. Well, there's some key dates that we don't want. We definitely don't want you to miss out on. Um, off the top, um, my wife mentioned it. Pastor Trina mentioned it. February 22nd, Pursuit Night. We are having Pastor Jules. Are you excited about it? 
He's coming all the way from the bay, from Oakland. He's going to bring a word um, that God's put on his heart to our church. So don't miss that pursuit. It's not this week, but the following week, February 25th. Man, I'm killing it today. Off the top, off the dome, y'all. I'm freestyling. February 25th is Commitment Sunday. Somebody say Commitment Sunday. And that's a day. And we want you guys getting with your spouse. Get, oh, look at, give it up for the media team. Good job, guys. We got it up there. Um, February 25th, Sunday, is Commitment Sunday. Now, we want you praying. Every, get, get with your, your spouse, your husband, your wife, if you're married. But start to ask God, what do you, how do you want me to get involved with ca- this, this campaign, this Imagine campaign? What do you want me to do? And we are going to fill out our commitment cards going towards our goal of $200,000 or more, at least $200,000 to get into our building to do all the uh, modifications, the renovations, uh, the HVAC and all that stuff. Um, and, and we're going to bring our commit. We're going to fill out those commitment cards on that day. So absolutely don't miss. So have some conversations and really lean in with the Holy Spirit. Say, God, what do you want me to do? We're not going to tell you what to give, but I will say this. Do something scary. If it don't scare you, it's probably not God. Because <laughs> he's a God who takes us from faith to glory. So I want you to really lean in and spend some serious intentional time with God and say, God, what do you want me? What do you want us? What do you want our family to do? For some of us, that's going to be something that's going to, it may mean putting off a vacation or, or, or delaying buying the new car so you can partner with us in this campaign. Or it might mean selling a kid. I'm just kidding. Don't sell your kids. But, <laughs> you know, get creative. It might mean selling off some property. We've had people, I've been part of campaigns gr- growing up in the church where people brought the keys to their vehicles and say, hey, we're giving up this vehicle. and we're gonna sell. I want to ask you to join with us and go be above and beyond the tithe and sow something sacrificial into the future of this ministry. And then on t- on. Uh, February 29th, Thursday, we're going we're gonna to have some time at the building. Can, uh, how many want to go? You going to be there? We're going to have some worship right there. Hopefully we can get in at that point. But we're going to be there and we're going to worship and we'll pray, God, bless our future. God, fill this sanctuary with friends and neighbors and loved ones with a son or a daughter or someone who's lost their way. God, do miracles as we prepare for a new season and a new day. Are you excited about it, church? And then, on th- take pictures because this is a lot. On, on March 3rd, that will be our first offering Sunday. So on March 3rd, uh, the week after Commitment Sunday, we will bring our first offering. And now we have six months to raise $200,000. Six months, so we're believing that God's going to do it. And some people are going to bring a, you know, a big fat check in Jesus' name, and God put something on their heart, and they're going to sow all at once. But many of us are going to give over the course of six months. We're going to bring every couple weeks or every, every month, and we're going to give, and we're going to invest into the kingdom, into the transformation of lives. Are you ready to imagine greater things, church? Are you ready to imagine lives change forever and ever? Yeah. Tell your neighbor we can do it because God's for us. All right, we're going to get into the Word. Turn your attention to the screen, or you can pull up your Bible app or open up your leatherback, Acts chapter 2. And when you have that, say, Amen, Acts chapter 2. Read a couple verses to open up, then we'll pray, and we'll dive in. Acts chapter 2, verse 46, it says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. How many would love to see us get to a place where we see people coming to Jesus every single day? How many would love to see your family members and people you care for and encounter on a regular basis coming to Jesus. I believe we're going to get there. Amen. I believe that we are on the verge of the greatest revival in American history, if not history, period. Will you be part of it? Pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, stretch our imagination, stretch our faith. Help us to see what you see, to believe for what you know. You are a God who moves mountains. You are God who heals the blind and deaf and mute. You are the God who raises the dead. You are the God of our past, present, and our future. So teach us to imagine and teach us to dream like you. To dream so, so greatly 
with such faith that we begin to see people added to the kingdom every single day. In Jesus' name. And we all said, amen, amen. We recently went to our conference out at TFH Vacaville and say amen if you went out there. Got a chance. There's a few you guys. Look at that, guys. That's one shot. Uh, we had to get there. We got, and that, those are seats from maybe an hour early. That still wasn't early enough. And we got to sit in the, the rafters, the lower part of them. But um, a move of God, powerful, supernatural. The, the, the words that were spoken, every message, um, it was phenomenal. Pastor Dave, Jabin Chavez, Chris Hodges. Uh, I mean, incredible, incredible um, uh, passion for the, for the kingdom and how God spoke to every heart was just phenomenal. Now, I, I, I threw this picture up because at a, one point during this conference, I'm just enjoying the presence of God and how God's ministering to my heart. And uh, as I'm sitting there just taking in the moment and the presence of God and the word of God, I, 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 I just kind of put my hand on the couch, uh, not the couch, but the seats that I'm sitting on in the lower level. I had, er, earlier in the conference, I had a lower level seat. And I'm sitting there, and then I realize as I'm feeling on the carefully crafted, delicate material and comfortable seats that cushion uh, my better side. Uh, <laughs> some of y'all didn't get that, all right. <laughs> I'm sitting there, and I realize I'm sitting in my seat. Let me tell you what this means. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Mark, um, executive pastor of T.H. Vacaville, knew as we, he's been part of this whole, uh, coaching me through this whole campaign and leading us and just helping us think bigger and believe bigger and just been a great asset to our church and, and been a mentor this whole way. Um, he said, listen, I know you're gonna, you guys are going to have to get seats for your church when you get in there. That's a lot of money. So I'm, I was going to send you some links and everything, but it turns out that we actually have to get new seats because we are going to have new seats in our new auditorium, which they're working on, right? And by the way, Harold and Jen, welcome to the house. Come on, wave at the folks today. Will you welcome family from TFH Vacaville? Y'all might be blessed with some worship leading from him soon if you, if you, if you stay plugged in. <laughs> but um, we, we, he said, I, I know you're going to need some chairs. Um, that's probably going to be twenty, thirty thousand dollars to suit your auditorium over there. He goes, but I thought, hey, we actually are going to need to buy some new chairs because we're getting new chairs for the new auditorium, and we don't want to leave old chairs in the, in the old auditorium. We want everything new and everything looking fresh and everything excellent, and they're great chairs. He goes, but we just want everything to be matching and in alignment. He goes, so I talked to Pastor Dave, and he, I told him we could either sell these chairs or we could give them to TFH and Thomas, and he thought it was idea that we give 400 chairs to TFH. No, to, come on, church. I was sitting in this conference. I said, that's my chair. That's my chair. That is my chair. And I'm just thinking, I said, I said, I said, Christine King probably sat in this chair. Chris Hodges, Judah Smith sat in this chair. I'm like, John Bevere, I bet you he sat, I'm sitting in John Bevere's chair, y'all. <laughs> Who knows who sat in those chairs? But 400 chairs, that's going to save us about 20, 30,000. Somebody ought to give God some thanks. Tell your neighbor we're winning. And we have this, this, uh, this saying that I want you to remember and keep at the top of your mind for the, the next, this season, is that buildings are not eternal. I got this from Pastor Dave. Buildings are not eternal, but what happens in them is. We don't build buildings for the sake of having new buildings and new structures and being fancier. We, we, we seek out these facilities and venues and buildings so that we can reach more people. We can build people. Amen. How many know that you got to bring people somewhere? you got to get them somewhere. And everybody knows all y'all Sacramento folks are super bougie. So we could try to put you in the park every weekend, but y'all ain't going to do that. <laughs> and I love how when you look at the book of Acts, we see a model, a template for how to do church. One of my frustrations is that uh, <laughs> when you look along the the layout of history, you kind of see that at various points, the church tends to lose its way. That we focus on good things, but then the good things become priorities over the great things. Or we start 
pursuing the, the glamorous things or the nice things and forget what we're all about. Now, we're, 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 we're going to build some buildings. We're going to get some properties. We're gonna, I, I believe before this is all said and done, we're going to have people coming to us and saying, I want to give you this building. I want to give you this land. I want to give you this property because God's moving in TFH. And if there's nothing greater that I could imagine could be done with this property than what I see God doing at the Father's house. How many can agree with that today? Are you believing in big prayers? We're believing for that kind of stuff. But we always got to remember why, why we do it, why we pursue it. I was sitting at the piano the other day, and uh, we're in a very unique position right now, but um, uh, we, I, I, I'm stepping in to help with our worship team in this, this season and uh, taking on the reins with a lot of the responsibility with that. And we've got a great team, and Ger Jared's provided such great leadership in so many different ways. Can you give it up for the worship team, the musicians? And, man, they're doing phenomenal, aren't they? Beautiful. But um, I, I was sitting at the piano realizing that, man, I'm going to have to learn how to do music again. <laughs> and you don't really forget, right, right, Harold? We don't really forget. It's always in you. But I sat in the, in the secret place earlier in the week, and the Lord said, you forgot your calling. I said, what? <laughs> and in my mind, have you ever had those moments where God whispers something to your heart, and then you think like a million thoughts within two seconds as a response without even voicing? I'm like, and so in my million excuses and justifications or trying to argue with God, we're like, what well, no, I'm doing your work. You know, we're going after a bigger house so we can reach more people. And we're making disciples and we're, we're developing leaders and we're launching new small groups. And we're reaching the lost and doing outreach and we love our city. And the, things are happening at, at the Father. What do you mean I forgot your calling? I forgot my calling. And then the Lord answered. He whispered to my heart. He said, you are a worshiper. And part of your calling is to raise up worshipers. Not necessarily to be doing the souls and all those things, but to make sure that the culture of worship is alive and strong. Because we firmly believe that one moment in God's presence in which God inhabits the praises of his people can change someone's life forever. Amen. One moment in the presence of God. And I, you know what happened? I started crying. You're like, Pastor Matt, you cry all the time. Hey, so what? Uh, some of y'all might be crying if you're not nice. If your team might not win today, if you're not nice to them. Me and God are like this. <laughs> you can be too, but. And I'm just crying out to God. I'm saying, you know what? You're right, Lord. Of course he's right. He's always right. So the next day, I went to the piano, and I'm just playing. It's an old piano that my mom bought. My beautiful mama who's in heaven worshiping her king. My mom taught us to worship, by the way. She used to play songs in the living room, practicing to lead during a church service. And we grew up hearing the sounds of guitar strums and melodies echoing, echoing throughout the halls of our, our room, not, knowing, not realizing that we were being surrounded by greatness and by anointing because it was just what we grew up in. Can I, can I just ask you to do something? If God's put people in your life, whether it be parents or friends or neighbors or small group leaders who bring a little bit of God's goodness and greatness into your life, don't take them for granted. Treasure that. And then be that to others. And she used to sing, and I, I, uh, we grew up just watching her do worship, sing songs, make music to the Lord. And so I sit at this piano, and I'm just playing and all of a sudden, new songs start to come to me. I haven't written a song in a very long time. And I'm just playing. And I just start to sing to the Lord. I wish I could remember the lyrics I recorded. Thank God for iPhones and Apple memo notes and all that stuff. And I'm singing to the Lord. And every time I have these moments with God in worship, I remember it's like I find myself again. Can anyone relate? It may not be music or worship, but maybe it's, maybe it's preparing a sermon or doing a Bible study or getting back on track with your prayer life or jumping into a small group and it's been a while and you realize, wow, how could I forget? Maybe some of you here right now and that's what it's like for you. I forgot how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. 
I sang on that piano. My wife's doing stuff in the kitchen and the kids are doing whatever they do. My son's on the video games and I'm just worshiping and tears are streaming down my face. And I remembered what it was like to be like David in obscurity in the shepherd field where it's just you and God. Felt like I found my way home. But Pastor Matt, you are a pastor. What do you mean? Even pastors and leaders, how many know? We can sometimes forget the things that God wants us to do most. If you're an evangelist, you need to be telling people about Jesus. Do not suppress it. Can I get a witness today? Don't get me wrong. We're all called to do this. But some of us are uniquely inclined and wired for specific things. Mine is not to be a musician. It's to raise up worshipers. I grew up in a house of worship, and my kids are all worshipers, and we live in a worshiping church, amen? And we're going to raise up a worshiping army because we believe that God has called us to be a lighthouse to this city, that when people walk over the threshold of our double doors, they will experience the very Shekinah glory of God. They're going to walk and lift their hands and get healed of cancer. They're going to walk in and find salvation. We're going to see the book of Acts relived in our day and in our era, and people are going to come to salvation day after day after day after day. Can you believe it, church? Can you see it, church? Can you dream it, church? Tell somebody, tell two people you're part of this. Part of this. That's why we do what we do. That's why we're going after our own home so we can have more than just a Sunday. Are you hearing me right now? Can I tell you, it takes more than sun a Sundays to make healthy disciples. Can you imagine what God could do in our future together as we, as a family, pursue what's in his heart for us? You know, not too long ago, when you look back at that picture, that was just a dream in Pastor Dave's heart, my pastor, in Vacaville. And he tells the story about going by the side of the road and praying circles and prophesying. And now they don't just have a, an auditorium that seats around 2,000 people. They, they have, they're building an additional auditorium on the property so they can accommodate more growth and more lives change and young adults and youth and teenagers having a space to encounter the presence of God. See, when God gives you something and he bursts in your heart, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It's not the end of the current thing. It's the beginning of the next thing. It's the beginning of the future. Some of us, we, we, when it comes to relationships, you, when you're single, all you can think about, especially if you want to get married, right? Some of you don't want to get married. You're single. You can serve Jesus happy single. Amen. But let me, let me liberate those of you who feel like, man, is something wrong with me because I want to get married? No, that's normal. And if that's how God's called you and put it in your heart, then, then sometimes this is what we do. Is, is we're single, and all we can think about is finding Mr. Right or Miss Right. How many have been there? Don't have to wave at me. But you know what I'm talking about. I feel like they with, that way with football. I don't have a dog in the fight right now, but I feel like, Lord, who should I court? Everybody in my church seems to have a team, and I don't have anybody. <laughs> should it be the Niners? Because my wife says it should be. How many say it should be the Niners? Or should it be the Rams? Because that's where I'm from. Any Rams fans in the house? Okay, all three of you. Amen. Much love, Pops. Respect. <laughs> and, of course, the Raiders fans are crying and they're saying, join us. Don't leave us alone. <laughs> join the fight. <laughs> Jesus started with 12. <laughs> we love all fans. <laughs> I want to talk to you for a few moments about preparing a place for the lost to come home. Preparing a place for the lost to come home. And here's something to consider today is that God works through geographical locations that are set apart for his glory. Remember, we're not just building buildings or pursuing venues for the sake of having them. It's about expanding and dreaming bigger with God. My brother was sharing a book with me last night as we celebrated my sister-in-law's birthday, Melly. Where's Melly? Is she in the house today? We got some birthdays. Happy birthday, Melly. Love you. Art's birthday. Elaine's birthday. Come on, give it up for all the birthday people. We celebrate you. We love you. Somebody buy him some cake. <laughs> but 
Lives are changed in spaces and places that are dedicated for God's use, for the ministry of the word and the exaltation of Jesus. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 2. It says, so continuing daily with one accord. Somebody say daily. Now, i got to just drop this in here real quick because some folks be complaining about coming just on Sunday. The average church attender these days, I think it's about one and a half times a month or so that they come to church. Good thing we're not just trying to raise up church attenders. We're trying to raise up disciples and followers of Jesus Christ who are living out their purpose and calling. But that's the average in, in our nation. No wonder football teams are losing like that. <laughs> but in the early church, the first century church, they went daily. Think about that for a second. Every day they were engaged. Every day there was something going on. Every day they're praying for miracles. Every day they're ministering to the lost. Every day they're singing and exalting the name of the Lord. Every day they're breaking bread. Every day they're growing in the faith. See, I think we live in a culture that caters to our preferences more than our purpose. And we walk into the church today, the church in general, and it's all about us rather than telling people immediately that it's all about him. Because we want to win people over by telling them that if you come here, we will cater to, our, to human beings' selfish preferences, our inclination towards selfishness, rather than picking, challenging people to pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. Can I tell you, God never blesses selfishness. He only blesses a life laid down for the glory of his name over billions of different decisions over the course of our lives. Nevertheless, God will use places and spaces. It says that continuing daily with one accord in the temple, this big public setting, it was the core of Jewish culture and religious gathering and worship in, uh, for, for the Jewish people. And it says they, and breaking bread from house to house. So this is the model for the early church. This is a model for us. that They had big gatherings where everybody joined the party. It's like a big birthday. It's like every week there's a Super Bowl on the Lord's Day. What is the Lord's Day? The Lord's Day is Sunday. That's what it was. It became known as the Lord's Day. Why? Because Jesus rose on that day. On the third day he rose, so they named it the Lord's Day. Some people wonder, why do we worship on Sunday and not on, you know, Friday or on the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath? Well, because when Christianity became a thing and Jesus rose from the grave, the early church sought to worship him on the day that he rose. And, and, and furthermore, they said that every day is the Lord's Day. But there's the principle of giving him our first and our best. So we start our week by coming together as a whole, and we worship, and we have a big old party to bless the name of the Lord. But then they did the other thing is they gathered during the week, every day, house to house. You couldn't fit 3,000 people after pre Peter preached, after the pouring out of the Spirit in the upper room, and he preached the gospel. 3,000 people were added to them. You couldn't fit all those people into the homes, but you can fit them into the temple And so we have small groups during the week, right? It's like for deeper fellowship and growth and discipleship and ministering to each other's needs. Sometimes people think that, you know, and it's a different mindset. I get it. You know, you don't get into ministry unless you love people or you shouldn't. Can I get an amen? Here's a few misconceptions that may not be your misconception, but some people think th that this is why. One, you get into ministry because you want to get rich then you're dumb. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. <laughs> I've been in this thing for a long time. I still haven't <laughs> experienced. <clears throat> I serve a rich God. Amen. <laughs> Two, you get into ministry because you, you want power. Or, now, some people might. But that is not the essence of leadership in the kingdom. The essence of leadership is what was modeled and taught by Jesus to lay down your life for others and to make yourself a servant of others. And in that, you will discover greatness. Right? Humility is greatness. Sometimes arrogant people come around and they think that because they're talented or they got the goods or they got education or experience that it qualifies them for ministry. I would say that more people are disqualified for ministry because of their perceived qualifications than are because they lack those things. I would take a humble 18-year-old who's hungry to grow in the faith and gives God their yes over somebody who's got degrees and 
experience up the wazoo and knows everything. How do you know those people? Because they tell you they know it. Hey, bro, so I was thinking, yeah, yeah, I know about that, yeah. And right when you're about to coach them on something, they tell you about all the things that they learned. But the way of the kingdom is humility. The way of the kingdom is never being beyond sweeping the floors and washing the tubs and cleaning the restrooms. Can I get a witness here today? Because in that is worship. In that is the way of Jesus. So the early church, they gathered in the big places like the temple, and they gathered in the houses. As, as long as they had freedom, they did those things. Now, under heavy persecution, there were times where they only had the option of gathering in houses. But what you see in Christian, in Christian history is whenever they had the possibility throughout history to, to have bigger gatherings, they would move towards it. Right? The Roman Empire, as soon as, as, as they had the opportunity, they would start to gather again. And it became an opportunity to reach more people. Tell somebody it's about reaching people. So some of the benefits of that dedicated space was that they had the opportunity to get, gather consistently and frequently. Imagine the, uh, the, 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 the difficulties in trying to cram thousands of people into homes. Like, can you host a small group? Can you? How about you? How about you? Guys, we have 100 houses and we still can't fit the people. But they had the temple. And as long as they had it, they utilize it as a place and a space to worship God and to preach the gospel. It also provided an environment where people who were not yet followers of Jesus, followers of the way, could come and hear the word of God preached by followers of Jesus. The word was preached. Can I tell you today that we will always be a word-centered church? We will always be a church that preaches from the word of God. I've heard that there are churches that would throw their Bibles aside and say, we don't need I heard of a pastor who did that. Isn't that crazy? Can I, can, let me tell you something. If you ever walk into a church where they throw the Bible aside and they start preaching politics and opinions of men or from good inspirational books or philosophies of men, let me tell you something. That's not the church. That ain't the church. Somebody say, that ain't the church. If we start to exalt any name above the name of Jesus, that ain't the church. If we ever lose our heart for making disciples and the mission, the great commission found in Matthew chapter 28, that ain't the church. If we ever stop loving people with the love of God, that ain't the church. If we ever stop modeling our lives after the way of Jesus and start imitating heroes and and, and, and and celebrities and worshiping people on YouTube, that ain't church. We are the church. We gather, we worship, we sing, we fellowship, we make disciples, we pray together, we work through struggles together, we are moved with hearts of compassion for the lost, we change the world. We are the church. Somebody say, we're the church. And so when we gather together, it's meaningful. It's not just a bunch of people in the building. When two or three are gathered together in his name, he is there in their midst. When we agree on, uh, about anything on earth, he's there and he blesses that. And, and he, he, he blesses the, co the corporate gathering of the saints. When we lift our praises together, the very presence of God falls upon us and manifests and is expressed in profound ways. When the church is the church... Hell trembles and remembers the words of Jesus that even the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Jesus could have said anything. He said the gates of hell won't prevail against your little small group. <laughs> he said the gates of hell won't prevail against your, 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 your big dreams. He could have said the gates of hell won't prevail against your prayers as powerful as those are. And as beautiful as those things are, but what he said was that the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Let me tell you something. If you don't have a church that you call home, find one. If you don't find one anywhere else, you can make it here. We welcome you. You can be part of this church. I'd love to be your pastor and help do life with you guys as part of this community. But the church is an indestructible force that even Satan's forces and the gates of hell could not stop. We are the church. And we're part of this beautiful thing that stretches across history and throughout geography all over the world. And we are the church. 
So they had this place to preach and to worship and to gather frequently and to preach to the lost. And people who did not know Christ could hear the message of hope and salvation. All throughout history, God has chosen to pour out his spirit on places designated for worship and preaching the word of God. And when I was thinking just about the, 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 the possibilities of our future, as we dream and believe and imagine for an amazing future of changing lives, I put a list together of just some random things that I thought, wow, wouldn't it be awesome when we get in our building because we could do those things. I'll throw that list on the screen right now. <coughs> wouldn't it be awesome to have our kids' ministry in their own dedicated space? Where they can paint it and make it beautiful and colorful and accommodating for our children and it's safe. And every week and they are coming into the house of God and they're learning the Bible. And they at 5, 7, 10 years of age are learning how to love and serve Jesus. How awesome would it be if our kids had their own worship service? I said, how awesome would it be if they had their own music going on exalting the name of Jesus? How, how many married couples are in the house? We've been talking about doing marriage events and conferences and getaways and trainings because I'm telling you, marriages be struggling these days. <laughs> married folks be struggling. <laughs> I've been there. But how awesome would it be if we had marriage classes and teaching people how to communicate and teaching wives and husbands how to love each other five years in, ten years in. By the way, tomorrow we're celebrating our 19th year anniversary. So it can be done. We're still growing. We're still learning. I made her mad a couple days ago. <laughs> but you know what? She still loves me. That's a win. She still laughs at my dumb jokes. That's a win. She's still dreaming about even when the kids grow up and do their thing and start their family. She's dreaming about what we're going to do in that season of life. Because in my wife's imagination, we have a future. That's a win. Can I get an amen? So we got a few things we can help some couples with. <laughs> we're a church that wants to raise up leaders or developing leadership culture. If we're going to advance and build churches and launch out locations in the future, then we need leaders. New small groups, we could have leadership trainings there. Uh, uh, kids camps during the summer where we have kids just packing out the auditorium and different stations and doing all these activities and having the blast and it's loud and it's crazy. And they're like, yes, I want to serve Jesus forever, mommy. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and, the ki and the parents will love it too because they're like, yes, we get to go to dinner while the kids are taken care of. Let's go on a date, baby. It's been six months. I <laughs> know. We have so many creative people. How awesome would it be when we have some of our music people and our artists and our rap artists and our poets doing concerts that minister to the broken souls of people as they walk into the house. Prayer meetings. Move on. Prayer is kind of important, isn't it? But what if we, we, we could have it not just pursuit on Thursdays, but what if we could have pastor's prayer, leader's prayer in the mornings? And during 20-day or 21-day or 40-day fast, we could say, hey, we're having afternoon prayer sessions during your lunch hour, and we're going to come together and seek God and worship and pray together. Wouldn't that be beautiful? How about we doing us doing We Love Our City on Saturday mornings, and we have people from the community driving up, and we have an army of people serving, handing them grocery bags, and saying, hey, we love you, we bless you, we care about you. Times might be tough, but God is tougher, and we're here to show you that God is real and he provides. Can I get an amen right now. We are dreaming an after school program and a, a homeschool co-op taking place all through the week so that parents who need that help with their kids homework and homeschooling parents who need some guidance or parents who say I want to homeschool my kids because I don't trust the system right now but I'm scared. <laughs> So we can have resources available for them throughout the week and they can come and sp support each other. Wouldn't that be amazing? So our youth could have their own space to invite their friends on Wednesday nights and they could grow in the faith together. Where are the youth of assistance? <laughs> so we could host community events. What if our baseball teams came and we were the hub where they said, hey, we're having a parent meeting. We have no place to go. You can come to the Father's house. Bring them in. We'll, we'll have the space set up for you. Let us know what you need because we're here to be a blessing and we're here to serve. We want to get a recording studio. Where's the, where's the recording folks? Because we believe God is going to put original music in the Father's house in Thomas for our house, but it's going to be anointed. And it's I believe this. I was in a conversation. I really believe this, that one day we will be known as a church in Sacramento that knows how to worship, 
not just for ourselves, but for his glory. But people will come to this house and say, teach us how to build our worship teams. Teach us how to cultivate a secret place with God. Teach us how to grow in the anointing. Teach us how to use our creative gifts for his honor and his praise. And some of you will be worshiping in a secret place, listening to the sounds of Kristen anointedly singing songs of worship and Malaya and Zach playing and Zach and, and, and Jason and the team putting together these productions. And heaven will invade the room over Spotify. <laughs> Come on, somebody give God a hand of praise. Let's keep dreaming. We're just getting started. Healing rooms. What if on a Monday you could bring somebody who just found out they got cancer and they need someone to admit they, you, you, they could come into our prayer healing rooms during the week. Or on a Saturday morning and say, believe, and we got people who are anointed and who have the gift of healing and miracles and faith, laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what God could do? Tell somebody he can do it. I'm going to move through this quickly. Now, all throughout Scripture, we see the importance of places and spaces for worship and, and preaching the word. In Exodus 25, God told Moses to build a tabernacle, which was a portable space, a portable temple, if you will. And he said in Exodus 25, I will meet you there and I will speak with you. It's a place, it's a space where God's people gather and God ministers and his presence shows up because it's dedicated to him. He told King David, I want you to build, actually King David told God, I want to build a temple for you. And God responded and said, that's a good desire, I'm paraphrasing. But you are a man of war. You got blood on your hands. So I tell you what, I'm going to have your offspring build the temple. And King Solomon would build the temple of the Lord. If you fast forward to the, to the era of Ezra and Nehemiah, the temple was rebuilt under Ezra's watch, and Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of the city as well as the city of itself, and it became a place, a sanctuary, a place where God's presence dwelt. It represented God being with his people. It's a pattern we see throughout the word of God. And some people say, well, that's all Old Testament stuff. What about the New Testament, Pastor Matt? What about today? They did, that, they did those buildings in old times, but aren't we the temple? Yes, we are the temple. But wherever we go and we gather and we dedicate that space and that time to God, we give God an opportunity to do what only God can do. And when we dedicate places and spaces, properties and buildings, lands and facilities to God's use, God will show up. How many of you first heard the gospel or you encountered God's presence or he did a miracle in your life when you were gathered with other people somehow in some place? Wave at me if that's you. That's a heck of a lot of people. Because it was dedicated to the work of Jesus, the Holy Spirit's work. In Acts chapter 3, New Testament, Peter and John went to the temple for prayer at around 3 p.m. That's an odd time, right? It seems like a weird time to go to prayer. Hey, guys, let's have 3 p.m. prayer tomorrow and Monday. <laughs> but that was the time for them. That was a, that was a, freak, that was a cons consistent time. It was dedicated to worship, to prayer, to seeking God. In verse 6 of chapter 3, it says, Peter said to a man who was lame and he was asking for alms outside the temple gates. And, he, and when, they, when, when Peter approached, he asked Peter, he said, hey, can you give me some alms, help a brother out? And Peter said this, this was his response, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man stood up, the bones in his legs were strengthened and healed, and he ran around leaping and praising God. It was a moment of the supernatural at the house of God, in the temple of God, in a space dedicated to the ministry to the work of the kingdom. So we see this throughout scripture. That when we gather as a church and we pursue the mission of heaven and we dedicate spaces and times and places of God, God moves and God does things beyond our own understanding. There was a woman named Amy Semple McPherson. How many have ever heard that name before? A great revivalist, evangelist, countless souls brought to the kingdom. And one day she had a dream. She had a vision that she would build a house a church building where God would bring thousands of people to encounter his presence, his healing, they would find salvation. And during the 1920s, the average church building size was, it could accommodate maybe 75 people, mostly small churches. 
In fact, you could drive through certain parts of Sacramento, you see tons of small churches down a down boulevard. It's because in those days, the most churches weren't, could fit no more than 75 people. But that didn't stop her from dreaming and believing because she had seen thousands come to faith. She had, she had the faith to see thousands continue to come to Jesus. And after a period of traveling extensively with her mom, she sensed that the Lord wanted her to build a church building in Los Angeles. And this is what she wrote that she sensed. She said, in this city of angels, we were to build a house unto the Lord. The Lord had showed us this, that this house unto the Lord was to be built in Los Angeles, whither tourists coming constantly from all parts of the earth could receive the message, then return to their homes bearing the message in their hearts. So she started to look for land. She looked for properties, trying to figure out <coughs> where it was that the Holy Spirit was leading them. And they found this circular land that she pursued, and she got the confirmation that that was the place that they were to build on. And she determined in her heart that we need to build a building that can, that can accommodate no less than 5,000 people. It's got to be able to seat 5,000 people. And she was only in her early 20s. Some big dreams for a 20-year-old, huh? She wrote this. During the first eight months after they built the building, the temple was opened. Between 8,000 and 10,000 souls kneeled at the altar, seeking the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Hundreds received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and other scores have been healed of their diseases in answer to believing prayer. Cancers have melted like snow before the sun. Wow. T tumors and tubercular, bo tubercular bones have been healed, and signs and wonders wrought in the name of Jesus. For the months, the revival has gone. On, sweeping on and on, day after day, without sign of cessation, the temple seats still continue to be filled with people, but also with the glory of the Lord. In 1923, lines outside, there were lines outside of that building just waiting to get into the presence of God in the house of God. 15,000 people gathered every single weekend. Forty million people in the past 100 years have come to Jesus in that building. Somebody, somebody give God a hand of praise. Because if you will imagine something greater, if you will pray bigger prayers, if we will dream with heaven, then the unfathomable can happen. And today that Angelus Temple houses the Dream Center under the leadership of a pastor, Matthew Barnett. It's known as the 24-7 church. They never close, and they feed the homeless. They, they give shelter to, to the broken. They help addicts get free from their addiction, and they pack out the auditorium with people coming to Jesus every week, every day. Because one woman, a 20-something-year-old young lady, said God can do something greater. Because she dreamed of something that would outlive her. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to just dream that lasts for my lifetime. I want to dream the kind of dreams that outlive me. I want to see the kind of visions that outlast me. I want the things birthed in my spirit that exist in the heart of God. I want faith that demands a move of God, faith that God honors and blesses because it's so locked into his will that he says, i got to move in response to that. I want us, I believe that we're going to be a church that prays bigger prayers than we'd ever believed and prayed for before, that our roles will be filled with people who find the liberating power of the blood of Jesus Christ, that we will be known as a sanctuary for the broken, a refuge for the lost, and a healing place for those who are bound, who are lost and confused and looking to find hope and salvation. That's what it's about, preparing a place for the lost to come home. I want you to look at this video that reminds us of this. Since I was young, I've been having a lot of problems. I grew up in an environment that wasn't real good for kids, uh, a lot of drugs and partying. But today's my birthday, and I got to tell you that I didn't think I'd make it to 18. Um, 
in the life I grew up in, there was a lot of things that went on. Uh, some that I was ashamed of, some that uh, I, I thought I'd be in all my life. I didn't know any better at some points. But uh, I grew up in church not knowing that God really existed, not knowing the truth, not knowing uh, the goodness of God. And at age 39, um, I started to wonder, started to crave, started to want something more. Uh, being in recovery, they taught me about myself. They taught me how to change things, why I do what I do. But they never taught me really about God. Uh, I had another kid. I started to see things without drugs, alcohol. Uh, a lot of things that really meant something to me. I didn't want to lose my life. So I started to crave that. I wanted that. Something, something different. Uh, me and my wife were going through things. And I walked in and I told her one day, I said, you know, I need to go back to church. And I don't know if the conversation happened exactly like that, but I do know when I looked online, I looked on Facebook and I saw a friend of mine that was a pastor of a church. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there whether I'm going to go with my wife or my kids or not because I got to find something for myself. And when I walked through those doors, my wife went with me, my kids went with me. We went as a family, and I had never done that before. When I walked through those doors, everybody and everything felt like home. I had found God. I had found this, uh, this black hole had been filled, and I hadn't, I'd been to plenty of churches. I'd never felt that before. So I asked my wife how she felt about it because for me, I didn't want to keep going there if she wasn't comfortable. But as soon as she said she was comfortable, I knew we were home. The Father's house has been a blessing to me and my family. I believe that God brought me here not only to save my marriage, save my life, but to help save many other lives. We're a part of the church now. And we have a sense of greater being, not for myself, but just a calling of God. And all I know is I'm in the right place, that this is where I'll be. This is what I'll do until I'm gone, till God calls me back home. That's what it's about. Imagining Lives like mine, changing for the better. Imagining, touching and reaching those lives forever. It's amazing. That's what it's about. We're building a house where the lost can come home. Would you stand to your feet and give God a hand of praise today? Come on. Give them a hand clap and say, God, we are believing. We're going to see it. We're with you, Jesus. Hey, TFH family. We are so glad you were able to join us for our online experience. We want to stay connected with you, and one way you can do that is to follow us on all socials at TFH and Thomas. Also, if you have never been to our Sunday services, I encourage you to come to our 1030 a.m. services every Sunday. God bless.